Hello and welcome to Beyond Biotech, podcast number 23, and for once, we have a bit of a theme. I'm Jim Cornell from La Biotech, and not so much of the chat this week because we've got a lot to get through. Hopefully I didn't just hear a sigh of relief. This week I've been preparing for a webinar next week with our sister company in part. A little bit nerve-wracking as it's a completely new platform. I've moderated lots of webinars before, but when things are a bit new, it can be a bit of a challenge. I remember the first time I was on the radio when someone spoke to me in the headphones as I was talking, so that they could count me into the news break. And it was a bit of a weird experience. I think I kind of froze a bit. Anyway, please do register for the webinar. I've included the link in the article that accompanies the podcast at labiotech.eu. Anyway, this week we have four interviews and three of them are on a theme, and that's antimicrobial resistance, as today, November the 18th, marks the beginning of Antimicrobial Resistance Week. We spoke with Holger Zimmerman, CEO of anti-infectives company Icurus, Neil Clark, CEO of Destiny Pharma, and Frederick Almquist, co-founder of CureTech Bio. And just so that it's not all about antimicrobial resistance, we also have an interview with the Chief Scientific Officer of Psychogenics, and that is Mark Varney. And that's, of course, not forgetting our weekly chat with global commercial real estate services company JLL and Travis McReady. Now it's time for the news you may have missed over at labiotech.eu. Researchers discovered a protein that facilitates the relapse of pediatric brain tumours. Chromatwist landed a second round of funding for fluorescent dyes for the flow cytometry market. And we had a special newsletter on children's conditions with 10 new articles. Eden Bio raised a million pounds to boost AI protein yields. Nutcracker Therapeutics noted the anti-tumor responses of its lead mRNA immunotherapy, and HutchMed announced positive gastric cancer study results in China. Nuance Pharma's RSV vaccine was cleared for trial in China. Brain Ever and 3P Biopharmaceuticals are developing a drug with the hope of curing ALS, and Foodative has brought the world's first bee-free honey a step closer. Researchers have been awarded £2 million to develop drugs to prevent epileptic seizures in children. There are potential new lead compounds for the treatment of depression and anxiety disorders. And Bell Group and Standing Ovation are partnering on animal-free cheese proteins. Researchers have created mini bone marrow in a dish to boost anti-cancer treatments. A pool bag-led consortium has been awarded €2.3 million Euros to develop an oral vaccine platform. And Immutep announced FD clinical results for non-small cell lung cancer. Growth in the UK cell and gene therapy sector continues. Enzymes could be the key to understanding the origin of DNA errors. We had an article on six biotech stocks trading below cash right now. A new study of mitochondria could pave the way for disease treatments. And Astellas met its primary endpoint in a gastric cancer study. Startup Cradle raised $5.4 million to design protein machines and cell factories with artificial intelligence. A new European project looks to unlock the potential of genomics. And we had an article on some of the hottest biotech companies in Canada. And you can read all of these and many more at labiotech.eu. So let's kick off with AI-enabled phenotypic drug discovery and preclinical CRO services company Psychogenics. To tell us about the company and its latest news is Chief Scientific Officer Mark Varney. Okay, so I guess the easy first question is if you could give me a bit of background on Psychogenics. Yes, Psychogenics has two business units. It, it has the largest is a contract research organization. Uh, this group provides preclinical models of diseases of the central nervous system as a fee-for-service. And so the models that you might think about would be rodent models of um, disorders such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autism, schizophrenia, depression, etc. The second business unit is a drug discovery group. And here the mission is to develop new medicines for the treatment of disorders of the nervous system. We've got a team of drug discovery experts that work on internal programs 
but uh, we also collaborate with other groups in the form of shared risk partnerships. And basically our approach is to use our technology, which we'll talk about in a little bit, is automated testing platforms and artificial intelligence to develop drugs using something called phenotypic screening. And that is looking at how drug candidates affect the behavior of the mouse. You kind of mentioned some of the things that you were working on. Um, could you kind of go into a bit more detail of the conditions that you're currently studying? Yeah, so primary indications that, that we're focused on right now are within the neuropsychiatric space. So that is major depression, schizophrenia, and anxiety disorders. As you probably know, these disorders impact hundreds of millions of patients, and, and many of them have you know relatively poor treatment options. And, you know, despite the fact that there's a huge unmet need here, there's really very few new mechanisms that have come along in the last 20 years or so to treat these disorders. In terms of depression, the most common drugs that are used are really only effective in about a third of the patients, with about another third showing a partial response and um, another third that really don't see any improvement in symptoms. And as you probably know, it takes weeks to months to see effects of these drugs. And if patients fail the first, then they go into the second or the third. And so for some patients, this can be a very long process and uh, unsuccessful process. We do, however, I think there is some light at the end of the tunnel. There are some signs that depression could be treated more rapidly and more effectively in these patients. For example, uh, there's some work that's been done on a, a drug called ketamine, which is an anesthetic agent that's used under close medical supervision. And it can be effective and have a, a rapid onset of action in some patients. And you may have also heard that there's interest in the psychedelic drug space, such as one of them in particular, such as psilocybin, which is the active ingredient of magic mushrooms. And this may also have a fairly rapid uh, and prolonged antidepressant activity, but again, sort of used under close medical supervision. I think what we'd like to do is identify drugs that can be used in a home setting and could potentially be faster acting and more effective in these treatment resistant patients. You mentioned the fact that these things take a long time to show any effect if there is isn't a positive effect at all, which I guess in something like depression is probably the last thing that people suffering from that need is to have this long and drawn out, I would imagine. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, one also has to think about, you know, suicide rates as well. And the fact that, you know, we know that, I mean, not surprisingly, that suicide is predominantly a disease of mental health. And so if we can treat those patients more effectively, we, you know, we can improve the quality of life and reduce potentially suicide rates. Yeah, exactly. It's um, fortunately people are talking more about mental health than they ever did, but it's still something that is uh, a huge issue. So it's definitely good that you're tackling this. I, I wonder if you could tell me about the various cubes. You have smart cube, neuro cube, pheno cube, e cube. Um, could you tell me about those and the discovery of drugs currently in trials with partners? Yeah, we've really spent the last 15 years developing a range of platforms that are automated platforms that use artificial intelligence. And um, these platforms have been set up to measure in an unbiased manner the behavior of rodents. So let me just kind of talk you through the various cubes. We've got the first is Smart Cube. This is a fully automated testing platform. And a mouse is introduced into the, the Smart Cube and it, it goes through a sequence of challenges using customized hardware. And what it does is we, we follow the behavior of the animals using high resolution cameras, and we assess the potential of compounds to treat psychiatric disorders by comparing the complex behavioral patterns induced by a, a reference drug in the animal. And we compare it to our database of known compounds. So for example, if we administer drug X to a mouse, we put it into the smart cube chamber and we look at the behavior of the animal and using our artificial intelligence systems we get a probability score that this drug x looks very similar to a, a certain reference compound that's say an antidepressant compound 
and that can be used as a measure to sort of help guide our drug discovery programs. And again, it's all based on the phenotypic behavior of the animals rather than mechanism-based drug discovery, which we think has real advantages in the psychiatric space. The other cubes look at slightly different measures. NeuroCube, for example, measures gait geometry and gait dynamics. So that is basically how an animal walks and uh, puts its weight on each of its legs and, and paws. And so you might imagine that this platform could be used to monitor, for example, how animals walk when they're susceptible to a neurodevelopmental disorder or a disorder that affects motor functions, such as, for example, ALS uh, or Parkinson's disease uh, or indeed chronic pain. And then our newest platform is eCube, and this looks at EEG changes. So EEG is a, is a measure that can be used to measure the electrical activity of the brain using surface electrodes. This is very powerful because what we found is that drugs produce a certain characteristic change in the EEG spectra. And again, we can use artificial intelligence to compare a particular drug against other reference drugs to help determine how drugs might be working and, and if they might be effective against certain diseases. And one of the real advantages of EEG is that it, it is a translatable biomarker. And so it can be used from rodents into other higher species and also into in human clinical studies. But the workhorse is really our SmartCube platform. Just to share with you sort of one of our success stories here, we, we had a collaboration with Sepracor, uh, now called Synovian, on a joint drug discovery program we, where we identified a drug candidate that was called CEP856. It's now called Euloteront. And in our SmartCube platform, it showed us a SmartCube signature that was similar to clozapine and other drugs that are used to treat schizophrenia. Synovian subsequently advanced Euloteront into clinical studies, and they were able to show a couple of years back that uh, the drug actually was very effective in reducing symptoms of schizophrenia in hospitalized schizophrenic patients. And that drug is now currently in phase three clinical development. We expect uh, those studies to read out next year. And it turns out that the mechanism of action of the drug Euloteron is distinct from any of the known antipsychotic drugs. And so this was something that was detected and advanced based on a phenotypic drug screening in mice. And if it gets approved following its phase three studies, it could be the first novel mechanism to treat schizophrenia in over 60 years. And I think this really highlights the power of, of our phenotypic screening platform. And it's something that we want to apply not only to schizophrenia, but as I mentioned, to depression and other neuropsychiatric disorders. Excellent news that it's... Uh been 60 years and finally something's going to uh, come out. When do you think or when do you anticipate that that will happen? The information we have to date is that the phase three studies will read out next year and we expect Synovian to fairly rapidly file their new drug application and then the FDA will review that application. So we think that potentially 2024 could be a year that we see the launch of uh, of Euloteron, but that will obviously depend on many factors that are outside of our control. I guess the most recent news was working with Emiria. Could you tell me what that partnership is? We were evaluating a, a collaboration with Emiria. These are uh, an Australian company that are working in the psychedelic drug space. And this is an area that's really undergone a renaissance what they're working on are compounds or analogs of a drug that's called MDMA, that's perhaps better known as ecstasy or, or molly. And it's a drug that affects mood and perception. And it can induce a feeling of closeness with people. Um, and it's been explored by several companies for treatments of post-traumatic stress disorder or PTSD, and also as a, as a treatment for depression. Now, the pharmacology or the mechanism by which MDMA works is rather complex. We know that it acts to release neurotransmitters in the brain, such as serotonin, noradrenaline, and dopamine, which themselves act on multiple receptors. But what Amiria have done is that they've, they've synthesized several hundred chemical analogs of MDMA, 
And because the pharmacology is rather complex and, and it acts on multiple targets, we really felt that SmartCube was the ideal platform to sort of deconvolute the potential therapeutic benefit of these analogs. And so it might be that as we start looking at these analogs, some of them may be directed towards treatment of depression, others perhaps may be directed towards treatment of autism. And really the idea is to develop safe analogs that don't produce sort of the dissociative effects that typical or hallucinogenic effects that typical psychedelics produce, but that we can, if you like, keep the beneficial pharmacology and, and try and get rid of the pharmacology responsible for those adverse effects. How does that work, being able to dissociate one aspect of a drug from one that you don't want? Yeah, so it involves obviously making chemical analogs of, of MDMA first, and you know the hope that changing the structure will change the pharmacology. And then we can use our SmartCube platform to actually identify drugs that show a similar behavioral effect. And then we can confirm with those molecules that show similar behavioral effects, whether they actually interact with some of the receptors that we know mediate the hallucinogenic effects. And for example, with these drugs, it would be, you know, the activation of typically of one of the serotonin receptors, the 5-HT2A receptor. And so that would be a typical path that we would follow. So in terms of developing drugs, what are the benefits for companies to working with psychogenics? Yeah, I think really our phenotypic screening platform, right, which is really novel to us, we have developed this smart cube platform where we evaluate the behavior of a, a you know a relatively complex animal, the the mouse, where we can look at its behavior in our platform. And where we've spent 15 years developing the hardware and building up a reference library of hundreds of compounds. We also have a team of drug hunters that are able to capitalize on our technology. So these are these are medicinal chemists who help design new molecules. These are biologists that follow the biology of the drugs and help advance these candidates from you know, discovery into clinical development. And then obviously through our CRO arm, our contract research arm, we're able to provide secondary behavioral assays that support our drug discovery collaborations. So we're really able to do an awful lot through our collaborations. And the platforms that you just explained, including the smart cube, are those things that you're constantly working to improve? Yeah, indeed. We're already working on our next version of these platforms. It's sort of a continued work in progress. For example, we recently transitioned our smart cube platform to use a certain type of artificial intelligence called deep learning. We found that this resulted in some improvements in predictions of behavioral activity. But we also update the hardware as new technology occurs. For example, we upgraded our cameras to high resolution cameras that provide even more accuracy with regards to following the behavior of the animals. And then we add, continue to add new reference compounds to our collection. You know, as we see in the literature, for example, there are compounds that interact with new receptor uh, systems or in new ways we will uh, typically procure those compounds and profile them in our platform so that our platform is really continually expanding and continually improving. And as far as working with other companies, when you do work on drugs or on different compounds, who owns the right to the commercialization of those drugs? Or does that change depending on the partnership? Yeah, we, we're very flexible. So we, we have a number of collaborations going on and they're, they're all really quite different. So let me give, give you a couple of examples. We have partnerships where we work jointly on a drug discovery program together with both parties uh, providing input into the project. And then at an appropriate time, our collaborator takes the license to the compound and then will develop that compound at their own expenses. We will receive royalties and milestone payments in exchange for that. We're also interested in joint ventures where both parties will develop the drug in discovery, but also then continue to develop the drug once it transitions from discovery into the clinical development, so with equal ownership. And then we're also interested in, in relationships where, in fact, we take on the development activities and in exchange for milestones and royalties from the collaborators. So we're very flexible. Uh, we're open to really interesting science and interesting starting points 
and interesting programs that can really make a difference in terms of improving treatment and mental health. Are there any other things that you're currently working on? We continue to be interested in broadly in neuropsychiatric disorders. You know, there are many aspects uh, that are still not well treated today. We talked about depression earlier. I think another area is anxiety disorders. This costs the global economy, you know, billions of dollars each year in lost productivity. So our mission at Psychogenics is to improve the lives of patients suffering from these disorders using our very sophisticated drug discovery platforms, which we think, you know, I've given you an example with Ulotaron, I think really has the potential to change the way we treat psychiatric disorders. Now it's time for the main theme of the show this week, and that's antimicrobial resistance. It's not on most people's radar, but it should be because it's a serious condition that should be ranked up there with cancer. It's not only costly in terms of money, but also lives as more and more infections become resistant to drugs that used to very easily handle them. So a lot of things to take into account, and our guests today paint a pretty good picture of the problems and also where we're at and where we need to be. So first up, as we mark the beginning of Antimicrobial Resistance Week, is Neil Clark, CEO of Destiny Pharma. Yeah, so Destiny Pharma's a uh, UK biotechnology company, but obviously international in our outlook. Founded, it was in the late 90s by our current chief scientific officer, Dr. Bill Love, who is still with the company. He, he left uh, Pharma, he was a Subagagi of artists, and set up Destiny Pharma and with the, with the aim of developing a new platform, new set of compounds to act as antimicrobials and uh, discovered the XF platform, which was at the, at the core of the company and still is you know, a, a driver of our pipeline, as, as you saw yesterday with our XF dermal uh, program announcement. But it's a very novel chemistry uh, in some of its classical biotechnology, you know, coming from sort of lab bench uh, chemistry through to preclinical testing in models and in this case looking to develop compounds that kill bacteria so straight away trying to focus on anti you know antimicrobial action uh, but at the same time the xf platform obviously is very successful has been very successful to date in in delivering compounds that do exactly that they kill targeted bacteria but also through their very fast action which is a novel patented process they also do not lead to an increase in antimicrobial resistance which is something else perhaps we can touch on. But Destiny Pharma over the years has gone through those early development stages of chemistry through to testing and models in you know, Petri dish, through to animal work. Um, but of course, our, with our lead program, XF73, we've actually completed phase two human studies. So that product has been in you know, hundreds of patients and excellent phase two data reported last year. And we're heading towards phase three with that program. And we have other earlier XF programs and perhaps which the dermal program which we reported on yesterday is still in the preclinical stage but that's for um, nasty wound infections skin infections which we can talk about but again it's coming from this XF platform different compounds uh, or in this case XF73 the same compound being taken forward as, as really sort of novel antimicrobials which which the world needs because of the threat of antimicrobial resistance so we listed i came on board five years ago six years ago now and we listed the company in 2017 so we're a public company to, to raise finance uh, that was to pay for largely for that phase two study that i talked about with our xf nasal program but we also came across another program which we really like from a totally different scientific background called ntcdm3 and this is a naturally occurring strain of a bacteria called clostridioides difficile or, or, or c diff which has toxic strains which can give you a very nasty gut infection and what we have is a, is a non-toxic strain, hence the, the NDCD. And uh, if you take that into the gut, if you've suffered from toxic outbreaks, it drives out the toxic strains of C. difficile. Our non-toxic strain sort of resides in, in the gut, especially in the colon, stops the inflammation and the, the, obviously the toxins that are produced by the toxic strain from, from being there and, and the patient recovers. And, and it's a very nasty gut infection, 29,000 deaths in the US a year. Uh, and that program also has finished phase two and is heading towards phase three. So in, in the actual company, Destiny Pharma, we have our XF platform, which we perhaps may talk about more with the XF73 Dermon, but we also have a totally different technology. Couldn't be more different, really. We have a naturally occurring bacterial spore 
approach, very targeted against these toxic strains of uh, C. difficile, but you know, our XF platform, as I said, it's all classic chemistry through to drug development. So it gives us some risk diversification, but what's great is that we have two late stage assets. So we really, as we head now, both these programs heading towards phase three studies, as you know, these are the final tests of new medicines. So if we're successful, these can be on the market or right, other studies will take, you know, two, three years, but these, you know, in the world of drug development around the corner, if we can complete the phase threes and we're looking for partners to do that, then we can potentially deliver, deliver two new novel drugs into this whole area of uh, where we are, which really is infection prevention. So we're not an antibiotic company. We're, we're looking to stop infections before they really take hold. I think post COVID-19, if we haven't all realised the benefits of you know, if we can deliver fast, safe, cost-effective medicines that can prevent infections, then it's a, it's a no-brainer, isn't it, to use them in, in healthcare for these threatening infections. And so a really exciting place to be. We're the infection prevention company. We've got two different platforms, but very much yeah, looking to find partners now to finish those phase threes. What we're talking about today is based upon the fact that next week, or from Friday's antimicrobial resistance week, I wonder if you could highlight maybe some of the issues with antimicrobial resistance? Yes, so Bill Love, again, our CSO, has been a, a leader in the UK and, and, and internationally in this uh, sort of really developing story of AMR. I think it was sort of uh, COVID-19 was described as a, a rapid boil up of an issue very quickly, whereas AMR is a, a slow simmer that's been going on for decades, but definitely in the last maybe 20 years has become really a, a major world healthcare threat. And, and AMR, obviously there's AMR Awareness Week, as you said, next week, but AMR is one of the topics, healthcare topics that's discussed at the top table, you know, World Health Organization, uh, G20, G7. Since I've really been coming into this, I guess this, this area five, six years ago, this is sort of a healthcare topic which sits there alongside sort of malaria, HIV, these, these type of subjects, which are obviously global threats to healthcare, but also perhaps it's fair to say poorly served by the international you know, drug development pharmaceutical industry. You know, we don't want to be overly critical of them, but the fact is that there was a lot of research in anti-infectious antibiotics. I, I come into Paddington Station, walk past St. Mary's Hospital. There's a plaque there for Alexander Fleming and and uh, you know the work he did on penicillin in the what was it the late 30s, 40s, obviously during the war and, and thereafter a very effective antibiotic but very quickly there were resistant strains developing you know these these bacteria so we focus on bacteria for antimicrobial resistance you know they're, they're fantastic in terms of you know some of the first organisms on the planet and they'll be some of the last and they are very you know very good at adapting to threats which obviously what you're looking to do with a say an antibiotic is obviously to, to, to kill the bacteria and stop it infecting you know producing the toxins and the, and the nasty effects that can have on on sort of the human health be it a, a wound infection or a blood infection whatever so antimicrobial resistance has always been there and, and there was there were you know many developments sort of post-war into it, development of new antimicrobials anti-effectives and uh, again i wasn't really involved in pharma then but perhaps there was a, a tail off of interest because there were you know, there were a range of antibiotics for, for different threats but you know, public way always was this antimicrobial resistance, which has increased uh, for various reasons in at the turn of the century or even before that. Uh, misuse of antibiotics. You know, if you look at the whole concept of One Health, of course, you have the animal kingdom. You know, I come from a farming background, and uh, must you know, I do remember in my youth uh, fairly freely pumping antibiotics into animals with various infections. And of course, you end up with misuse. They end up in can end up in the food chain, water supply. But similarly, in the, the human world, you know, we've all rushed to the doctor wanting an antibiotic because we've got a sore throat. And I think there's elements of misuse and overuse. But of course, all the time you're exposing. You know these some of the very nasty bacteria to these treatments and their you know resistance comes because they're very smart at adapting so you've had this sort of mismatch of perhaps misuse of existing treatments a rise in uh, you know resistant strains and at the same time big pharma biotechnology perhaps not investing in the research for new new mechanisms new drugs that can could, could beat the resistance so you, a little bit of a perfect storm of a lack of new novel products coming through and at the same time, a, a growing need for new products. Why has there not been an investment in the last sort of 30, 40 years in new antibiotics? I think some would say that because they're considered quite cheap and cheerful, you know, low pricing, low lower margins, not large profits. And of course, we all know drug development is very expensive. There's been other areas of healthcare where there's, um, you know, still obviously still very hard and, and risky, but perhaps there's more viable, more realistic commercial returns, you know, oncology, orphan drugs, 
where you can get higher pricing and the commercial model is better established. But I think that's changing. You know, there's companies that are coming back into the space. Some of it's being driven by pressure and incentives from governments, be it regulatory support or what they call sort of push-pull mechanisms, even, even marketing support, whereby you have sort of guaranteed annual purchasing of, of a quantity of a, of a new antibiotic. So you see players coming back in. But in the meantime, companies like Destiny Pharma, we're not the only the only uh, you know biotechnology company. We've been working away, high quality research, and are now coming through with what's key, of course, which is quality clinical data to then hopefully do these phase three studies to deliver these, these new drugs. You know, we're quite focused in where we are. We're, we're not covering every possible infection. We have two very targeted approaches. Our lead assets, one is for post-surgical infections, such as you call, caused by Staphylococcus aureus, such as MRSA, and also, as I said, C. difficile. So, uh, you know, we're a part of the solution, but you know, we're really excited where we are. But there is still this global threat. You know, I think it's highlighted in, in the COVID-19 pandemic, obviously a viral infection. Many of the you know, respiratory infections also at the same time caused bacteria were were joining in many bacterial infections and again doctors struggling with um, effective op- treatment options to try and you know, kill treat these bacterial infections and of course when you do treat an infection and basically remove the infection it's gone you know you, the patient or, or the condition is gone and in the worst case of course the patient survives these are not um, managing conditions in many cases we you know we're looking with effective antimicrobials infection prevention to remove that infection completely so it's, the benefit is perhaps not appreciated as well in terms of the cost benefit and the pricing you know all the constraints the world has in terms of the cost of healthcare more recognition should be given to the value of, of anything that addresses infectious diseases be it in our case infection prevention which you know i guess is linked also to the vaccine approaches when we're not a vaccine company as well as if infection does take hold, you know, how do you sort of knock it back, kill it with, with antibiotics? So, yeah, so there's a complicated picture, but we'll be putting something out as well on you know, MR Awareness Week. But you know, in 2019, a million deaths reported due to antimicrobial resistance. You remember the Lord O'Neill report several years ago talking about, uh, I've, I've got it written down here, in 2050, 10 million deaths a year due to you know, the antimicrobial resistance and the inability to treat serious infections and the cost the healthcare cost a hundred trillion dollars. So this is a you know, massive impact potentially of, of this inability to, to treat infection. And remember, every almost every procedure you have, you can pick up an infection alongside that. So you could be going through a you know quite a, a complicated modern cancer treatment surgery. But if you pick up an infection, you know, you won't be moving quickly on to your radiotherapy or chemotherapy because you'll be too ill to manage that. So they sit across a range of healthcare challenges as well as sometimes, of course, just the infection on its own in isolation. So really, really interesting area. It's not be too gloomy, but definitely there's some major, major threats there. But there is an increase in activity and companies like ourselves, I think, are really doing a great job. And what we're doing, of course, is going through that expensive, relatively long process of clinical development, clinical trials. But we're at the end game. Phase threes, we know they're very safe. We've got great efficacy data. We just need to now demonstrate it in those larger phase three studies. And that's our number one aim with our two lead programs in the next uh, sort of 12 to 18 months to get those studies started. You mentioned the XF73 dermal product already. I wonder if you could tell me what that is and how it works. Yes. So so as, as I said, the XF platform is a very effective, fast set of compounds that kill bacteria. They act at the bacterial membrane very rapidly, leading to a very rapid death. And the rapid death means that the bacteria doesn't have a chance to become resistant, to adapt itself, to be resistant to our mechanism. Um, we have a nasal gel, which is our lead program for decolonization in the nose prior to surgery. But we've also been looking at other skin type infections. And one of the areas that we're researching are infections associated with uh, wounds, deep wounds, ulcers. This is a dermal program to prevent these dermal infections taking hold. Uh, one of the patient populations that we're looking to target uh, are diabetic patients where unfortunately due to problems with their, their lower limb blood supply, the leg ulcers, the leg ulcers can get infected and you have uh, a very common condition called DFU, diabetic foot ulcers, a very nasty, uh, which can lead to quite serious infections, which again, when these skin infections really become a problem, of course, is when they get into the bloodstream and you can, obviously relatively rare, but you can end up with some very serious blood infections, sepsis, et cetera. So again, as soon as you can stop and control these infections, of course, you help promote wound healing, which is a you know a complicated process. The infection is one component of obviously the recovery of the wound. But this is a, a underserved area. 
unfortunately across the world the number of diabetic patients as it were people suffering from diabetes is increasing and again fairly consistent in proportion unfortunately do pick up these uh, ulcers and the associated infection so a very large patient population which currently is, is poor, poorly served by current um, treatments be again be they antibiotics where they're again big problems with resistance or bandages silver line bandages so you know that's something we're looking at so our dermal program xs 73 dermal is a formulation which apply to the skin and 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 one of the advantages of the xf platform is that they stay localized they don't get absorbed into the bloodstream so we're looking to you know stop the infection taking hold where it where it counts which is in the, that wound or that ulcer so we've been developing formulations there and uh, i think well, crikey it must have been in 2021 we announced a some support, which effectively is, is, is funding support and technical regulatory support from a, a US expert group, government group called NIAID, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And they effectively, they, they like the XF program. They previously, previously supported our nasal gel. They're now looking to support us with this dermal program. And they effectively carried out uh, the first phase of work in models, animal models, which was reported earlier this year. And just yesterday, we announced uh, that following on from that successful work, they're now carrying out the second phase of work, which will be the final piece of work with this XS73 dermal program before we can actually then go into uh, human studies. So this will be hopefully be our next clinical program Again, we could potentially be starting those studies maybe maybe ne- back end of next year into 24. Next is to Frederick Almquist, who is the co-founder of CureTech Bio. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about the work that you do. My expertise is uh, making molecules, if I put it like that. So I, I took a PhD in organic chemistry. Uh, already back then, this was in the middle of the 90s. It was cool to make a new molecule that no one made before, but uh, I have always been driven by the, you know, what if this new molecule would actually do something? <laughs> and uh, so to learn more medicinal chemistry and to apply the, the methodology more, I, I went to St. Louis, to Washington, Washington University in St. Louis, and uh, as a postdoctoral fellow and and there i started on a project where i'm as a chemist was supposed to see if we could design compounds that affected e coli and e coli is uh, the main cause of urinary tract infection uti and the project was uh, trying to to uh, inhibit the ability of e coli to attach to the urinary tract because what they need to do that is a a fiber-like structure and we wanted to inhibit the production of this fiber Uh, so a a long story now but but that that's how i ended up in the antimicrobial field because the approach back then this was in the end of the 90s was uh, what's it's called antiviral and so because selectively taking off this fiber would make the E. coli unable to infect the urinary tract, but it would not kill it. And antibiotics, per definition, they kill bacteria or stop growth. So uh, this would be kind of a more elegant alternative for a certain niche of infection. And uh, why I'm saying that is because if you don't kill or stop growth, you will not have a huge impact on resistance development because that's driven by by the fact that if someone can survive an antibiotic, someone, I mean a, a bacterial cell, it will start to have an advantage and start to grow. And uh, so that's how I came into the, the field of antimicrobials in the, in the beginning of the 90s. And the more we worked on alternatives and uh, made more, you know, synthetic applications to our discoveries. We all of a sudden started to apply these uh, libraries of compounds to to more different bacteria and discovered uh, new ways of, all the way from these more antiviral type of compounds to compounds that are truly antibiotic. With saying that, I'm in favor of all approaches. <laughs> Many researchers just want one thing and, and everything else is bad. 
the reason for that is if you have an in infection is so broad, you can have a chlamydia infection, more than 100 million a year on the planet uh, need uh, treatment for chlamydia infection. You can get blind if you get trachoma in the eye, which is uh, chlamydia trachomatis, or you get the sexually transmitted disease. However, you don't die and you don't die quickly <laughs> from that infection. You have time to diagnose it and you can start to figure out how to treat it. So in that segment, and also urinary tract infection would be a similar situation. When you can diagnose and, and know what you're infected by, what, what is the pathogen, then we, we believe that disarming antivirulence approaches can be fantastic. But in the other extreme, you end up at the hospital, you get unconscious, and uh, you know a day or two later, you might be dead because you got a sepsis and some kind of extreme infection. And then the physician have no chance of even knowing exactly what bacteria you got. And then they need to rely on an antibiotic that quickly takes down the bacteria. So in that segment... New antibiotics that work, have a new mode of action, new mechanism is, of course, what we desire. I'm open and, and actually working in all these directions with different projects. Obviously, antibiotic resistance is a huge issue right now. And you hear stories that it's going to be a bigger killer than cancer. Um, is it something that people should be worried about or are we getting closer to being able to do something about it? I say yes on both. We should definitely be worried because uh, I think what people don't appreciate is that it's not infection alone going from perfectly healthy to an infection and then you die. That, that is not common. I mean, that's quite rare. Those extremes happen, but it's not common. But when it's definitely common that is in healthcare associated infections and those who suffer from those infections are often patients uh, being treated for cancer for instance so it's not that it's either cancer or infection i would say if you have cancer and need treatment you will be dependent on on an antibiotic that will work otherwise you will die from an infection uh, after a while because you you take down the immune system with the treatment. So I think that is what people need to understand, that it's it's so closely related to all, uh, yeah, to cancer treatment, but also to surgery. What we take for granted, like doing a hip surgery or um, even getting catheters uh, while you're, you're being at the hospital can be super problematic if, if antibiotics uh, are not functioning anymore. But I said yes on the other one as well, because I know that there are a lot of really good research going on and many fantastic groups working on these problems, but uh, it's mainly in academia. So what, what's needed is, of course, to fill the gap between big pharma and ideas generated in in academia and actually get it to the market. That is the challenge today, I think. You just had a paper um, in a scientific journal about a new type of antibiotic. Can you run through what that is? Yeah, that that is also a project that is ongoing and also have been going on for quite a while. And also what I really appreciate is this is typically a collaborative project when expertise come together, right? So. I would then be heading the, the chemistry group, the organic synthesis behind this. But then a lot of the biology has been done in, in St. Louis again with Scott Halkren and, and Mike Capron's uh, laboratories. What we said is that we have a, a new class of antibiotic in that sense, that it works uh, in a new way. We are not sure of the, you know, the exact mode of action yet. We know what we affect, but there is no, not a one specific target at the moment, but uh, we're working on that. And to be honest, uh, the best antibiotics are often of that kind that they affect a few things and not just one. <laughs> so it's exciting. It's a new chemical entity 
uh, most likely then working with a new mode of action. So uh, the chance of having then a, a, the resistance development will then be slower than if you just have a modification of an existing class, if you see what I'm saying. Right. I'm not saying that we, we will not get resistance because it's, it is an antibiotic, so it, it kills. And uh, when that happens, resistance will come. I'm pretty sure. It's just a matter how long time it will take. I can also add that this, what we also show in this paper is that this new class also synergize with a, a couple of uh, important antibiotics. What synergize mean is that they actually boost the effect of uh, something that might be considered not working. So we have shown that uh, bacteria that are fairly resistant, tolerant to vancomycin, for instance, can get uh, hit if, if they uh, also get our compound uh, added to it. And uh, as I described to you earlier, the, the most extreme, if you're a physician and, and get someone on a really bad day and, and they are unconscious and so forth, and you need to quickly get uh, an effect, a combination like that would be wonderful because then you could rely on a, and trust that you will have an effect. But we're not there. We're far from it. It's a basic scientific discovery so far. So it's not at all a drug that's on the market. That's important. So where are you at on that kind of pathway to that? What do you still need to do? First of all, in the academic setting, we need to continue improve the compounds. And that's what we're doing. We're designing new. We have some really interesting follow-ups uh, that we haven't published. And uh, of course, what we're chasing now then is beside having this antibacterial activity in vitro uh, is that you want them to also have good properties for being a drug. So you have to improve all these pharmacokinetic properties. And um, if you take a pill or if you get it uh, intravenously into the body, you need to have an effect uh, a certain lifetime of the drug, etc. So it's it's such properties we, we're looking at. And also showing effect in various in vivo models. And then after that, to actually reach patients, then uh, I would say that big pharma need to, to come in or, you know, a lot of investment need to be done to actually take something all the way to the market, of course. Will that mean like a spin-off business coming out of the university or will it be just selling something to a bigger company? Exactly. As we have, a, we started a couple of years ago based on what I just said, that if, if you're doing research in academia, uh, which actually can help people, if you just publish everything and don't protect it, then no one can really develop it. For me, it's kind of would be kind of unethical to just publish and so we decided to, and in Sweden, we have a very special situation. It's called a teacher exception. And this is unique. So it means that we, as researchers, as principal investigators, own our results and not the university. And in the rest of the world, I would say most cases I know, it's the university own what's done by the researchers. It sounds fantastic, but uh, the drawback is that there are very small resources to actually pay for patents and do that part. But we decided a couple of years ago to try to set up a company that at least would cover the IP. So it's kind of a company that when we get ideas and when they have reached a level at, at, in, in our academic groups, when it's, uh, it would make sense to, to move on then they can go via this company and it's called CureTech Bio. There are a couple of projects there. And uh, but again, to answer your question, a bigger company would need to come in with more resources to actually take it all the way to the market. But let's say that these smaller companies can take something to phase one. That, that would be a good achievement. But to then take it all the way you need some more bigger investments and bigger companies to come into play and that happens now and then i know such cases of course 
in a case like this, when an announcement is made, there's often a lot of optimism and everybody gets excited because they think that something new is right Mm. around the corner. That's clearly not the case. I mean, how far away in terms of timeline do you think that this would be realistically? Oh, yeah. Again, it's a politician type of answer. (laughs) No, but but it depends how quickly the bigger actors will come in. The earlier they would come in and support, the quicker the process will be, of course. On the other hand, when it's uh, critical segments of uh, drug discovery and an urgent need, there are steps that that, that can go quicker. You can get uh, to pass FDA, I mean, to to, to get quicker into to these um, tests. So you can cut a few years when you're in, in infectious disease uh, in some cases. But otherwise, it's a couple of years for sure. If we go back then to the pandemic and the COVID situation in the world, if we start to see this happening also for antimicrobials in general and antibiotics and, and we get all of a sudden more people ending up at hospital or uh, dying. I mean, that's what we actually measured in, in, in the COVID, how many more died than normal. And we got panicked, uh, of course, and we came together. And I mean, with we, I say countries and European community and US and East, everyone came together and made up guarantees for the big pharma to produce vaccine. Of course, they had 20 to 30 years of basic research behind these new vaccines. But then they got this incitement to really go for it. And I think we will need a similar situation in the end for antibiotics uh, to, to have this really big boost and big effect of of getting many more compounds on the market we need such incitaments. Right. I know John Rex uh, had a good kind of a metaphor. <laughs> and, uh, and what it's all about is that uh, if people appreciate that we need this, that we need it on the shelf when, when, when it's really dangerous and we need to be able to use it. It's the same as having a fire department. <laughs> That's how he views it. And firemen, even, I mean, poor cities often you know prioritize to have someone that can take care of the fire if if it pops up and the way of doing it is not that the firemen get only paid by fire they have to be there so i think if people start to realize that uh, this is what's needed that that is kind of my hope that if resources are put there, I think we will find solutions. It's not that scientists are completely out of ideas. It's more that, that it's a, a gap in really developing things to the market. Sometimes that's because with COVID, it was just an instant crisis. And I think this is something that's kind of, it's behind cancer in terms of the public perception, maybe. But once it starts to be more in the public radar i guess maybe it will improve yeah exactly and that's why i think it's so important that connection that it's it's actually they are connected they are related in sweden we have every year a gala about cancer and and where we bring in money to support cancer research and uh, which is super important of course don't get me wrong but uh, then maybe connected to such a gala, it would be a nice to have a pitch about the need for antibiotics as well in, in this treatment regimen. These are many, many of the issues that need to be discussed and handled when it comes to this. It's, it's of course, I am a chemist, so, so my main thoughts are about new alternatives and new inventions in that sense, but it's, it's also about how the society acts uh, like the climate crisis can also be discussed in the context of antimicrobial resistance what what will happen with more extreme weather will we get more cholera uh, outbreaks yeah for sure warmer temperatures i mean it, we will have more things going on with a with a climate change as well which will have impact on the need for new antimicrobials
And finally, on our look at antimicrobial resistance is a chat with CEO of Icarus, Holger Zimmermann. My name is Holger Zimmermann. I'm a biologist, virologist by training. <laughs> when I started, I studied biology, worked on, on different viruses, started in industry, and then worked with, with Bayer, and they decided to leave the anti-infective space. And uh, I was part of a spin-out, which formed Icurus. And I'm here since the beginning, uh, responsible first for virology, then for the whole research uh, area, and uh, currently as CEO here at Icurus. So this is what we are doing. And we are active in antivirals, antibacterials, and running projects from early research up to proof of concept. And these days, we are also doing the first phase three trial. So we try to spend the whole R&D process, if you wish. If we move on to AMR, the uh, antimicrobial resistance week or the awareness week that starts tomorrow, I wonder if you could kind of maybe explain why there is a need for that and why it's not higher up on the agenda? Yeah, I think there's a need for the antimicrobial week. It's all about awareness, right? And uh, it's about issues which are quite obvious in that field. And I think there's a certain imbalance. So on one hand side, you have a high medical need with unsolved problems, patients running out of medications for resistant bugs, for instance. And on the other side, you do see little innovation and you see see big pharma who is leaving the field and you uh, are left with biotechs in the field basically struggling in, in a way. And, and this is the problem. Therefore, it might not be high on the agenda because it's not a, a huge commercial topic these days. So this is a uh, big, big pharma le left it. And then again, too many problems in the world, I would say. Uh, on, on one hand side, I, I'm always telling, so if there's something good about COVID or Corona, then that people learned how hard it is if you need something and you do not have it. Right. So, so in Corona times, we, we learned it really the hard way. Everybody was looking for a vaccine to fix a problem and whatnot. And talking about AMR is sort of of the same. Right. So we are we, we need something. It, it's not that urgent in, in terms of a, a rapid pandemic, but it, it's also coming in the early days, let's say two years ago. So the, the, there was uh, the discussion and, and the, the parallels seen between Corona COVID. Right. So, so when we today have uh, discussions about these topics, we are also, of course, faced with a problem that there are many problems, and, and we'll come to that one, where we also need to talk about funding and, and money, which, which goes into research and development in, in that field. But these days, with the war in Ukraine, with many problems all around the world, also budget-wise, it's really a, a very tough thing to tackle that issue. So, Long story cut short, so high medical need, unsolved problems. So this is why there is a need for that, that week and awareness. And it's not that high on the agenda because there are too many problems currently around, but we shouldn't shy away for this one. And on the other side is we are for years now striving for solving that problem. We don't have it yet. So and um, Probably we'll also discuss about the, so what are the issues, the, the hardcore issues here, and, and what could be points to solve the problem. So I was just thinking what you were saying there was so true in terms of the pandemic. It was one of those things where I think as a species, we humans tend to react to things that happen rather than tackling it before it happens. Do you think that that's what it's going to take for this to become kind of pandemic proportions? Or do you think that, that we will address yeah. it a bit better? That's a tough one. In a way, you're perfectly right, because if you would have talked about pandemic preparedness before Corona, people would have laughed and said, forget about it. So we, we learned it with, with Corona and there are always a discussion. So lessons learned. What have we learned from this pandemic and whatnot? And AMR is around, was around, and, and still we have that issues and we are in a way on, on the track. But I fear that if pressure goes, other problems come, that it's not 
so high on the agenda again. And we need to keep it on the agenda because we will look extremely stupid if we run then finally into the problems and we do not solve it. Which is currently the case, and, and this is coming to the, so where do I see issues? So from a biotech perspective or business case perspective, it's all about pricing and reimbursement. So first of all, it's scientifically tough to find a solution for that bad, nasty bugs which are resistant. So this is uh, the, the one thing. The other thing is coming from biotech, you need to have investors, you need to have a, a story to tell. And it's a tough story if you say, okay, so I do have a big problem, which takes a lot of time. I'm not too sure if I will be successful. And by the way, I have no clue if there's a market for this one. And ideally, we shouldn't have a market for this one because nobody wants to have the next pandemic and nobody wants to run into problems with this AMR. But we must have drugs in case we have it. And there the pricing and reimbursement topic comes into play because ideally you need to decouple the numbers, the revenues from the benefit you have as a, as a company if you have success. That, that's the other thing. So, so if you are successful and have a drug which, which solves and then you park that drug for rescue medication, you will not sell it. Which, which is not a business case, right? So therefore here really is, is a point which one needs to overcome and, and, and take. And there is, uh, and we are together in, in the Beam Alliance with, with many other companies to fight for this one, to be an advocate for, for, for this one, to really make clear. So we need a solution here. And, and, and some solutions, of course, are that you need ideal pull mechanisms. So, so really mechanisms which brings you back into the field and gives you some some revenues back, right? So there are, there are for instance, this uh, transferable exclusivity extension. So this would be a new, let's say, virtual money in a way. The idea of giving extend to another drug in the pipeline if you have an AMR drug. So this would be some virtual money, let's say. So we as a company develop such a AMR drug We outlicensed it to a big pharma company who gets prolongation on a on an existing drug on the market. That means money without using the antibiotic, right? So this is really decoupling this one. That means there are really ideas out there, but what is currently still a nightmare, it's not there yet. Nobody knows when it will be there. And this is a, the, the current issue. From a biotech company perspective, talking to our investors, we need to convince them on, on our projects, on the money they spend. That gives you a hard time to get funding, to get money for projects which have a unknown future, if you wish, right? So, and, and this is, I think, the core of the AMR problem. So Big Pharma went out, biotech takes over, but you need a story which makes it attractive for investors as well. What you're saying as well, the pricing is an issue. Um, if it was something that was really expensive, that would make a difference. But then you look at something like cancer. I think that that's very much in people's eyes. I mean, you, you see a lot of people like in the Boston Marathon or the London Marathon, they run for cancer cures mm -hmm. and there are lots of organizations dealing with cancer care but nobody would ever run the berlin marathon for amr it, it's yeah. um i think here an interesting point is and it come to to the expensive and and the 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 feeling about what's what value should a drug have you mentioned uh, cancer and and I, i think there are other chronic diseases and people live for quite some time with it everybody knows about it and, and think. in contrast to that and bacterial infection is very acute right you you have it you fix it in a week two weeks or whatever and then it's gone mm. so what people forget is you've saved a life with this acute treatment right and and this is the other weird thing so the, the pricing is weird because you pay for and don't get me wrong so it, it's very important and every family probably lost relatives on, on on cancer already but you pay for cancer drugs for prolongation of whatever months years whatnot substantial amount which is fine right and, and not not discussing what what value a life has with an active antibiotic which also is resistant breaking 
you save a life, full stop, right? So you have an acute infection, you have it, either you die or you survive. So that, that really is, is a value on its own, but it's not reflected in the price yet. Why is it? Maybe because it's a very short and acute treatment. The other thing is maybe also the past, because antibiotics have been around for decades already, the old antibiotics, and nothing new came up or not little came up in the last years, which means the old stuff is all generic, right? And everybody's used to go to the pharmacy to get whatever, cheap antibiotics. And now a new antibiotic comes around the corner and says, so, okay, but we need whatever, thousand, 10,000, 50,000. Wow, that can't be, right? Right. But on the other side, you, you, you pay whatever amount for, for cancer drugs for every month. So, so, so there's also a clear imbalance. So nobody is willing to pay a substantial amount for life-saving drug for whatever weird reason. This is on the one hand side. And the other side is, and this is what we discussed already, if you have an effective drug, you rather not use this in order not to create new resistance and to keep it as a last resort therapy, right? And and here is, is really the this balance. I think we need proper pricing for, for the drugs and we need a decoupled system, again, which, which just gives you the payback without the high numbers because you rather not not have it, right? So, so this is really the solution of, of, of the problem. But we are fighting. I think step by step, we are going there. It's on the EU agenda. There are certain uh, activities already ongoing in the UK, right? So they are working there. And the Pasteur Act in the US. So, so I think things need to come, but it's not there yet. And for, for the time being, that's a hard time for biotechs. How do you think that we get past that point? Do you think it's at the political regulation level or? I think it needs to be on, on, on that level to some extent, right? So that there must be agreement uh, how these things are reimbursed on an overall level if you think of these TEs. But there also might be some local subscription contracts on, on a national level to se secure the access. And, and with, with such an, an hybrid model, you, you probably should be able to create an attractive ecosystem because this is, I think, what, what we need in order to create innovation and to bring innovation to the field to the yeah, benefit of the patients in the end. Um, I don't want to make this all about AMR. I'd like to learn a bit more about what you do within the Beam Alliance and some of the things that you're working on in this field as well. Like with your incubator, incubator, <laughs> right? Yeah. The, the iCurus has an incubator. So, so what, what are we doing in the uh, incubator? So, this is sort of a, what what we think try uh, quite new and 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 interesting company incubator without having the, the the project really in house. So, it's rather that we learned in the past. So, we are also doing in licensing. So, we are looking for projects which which of course fit to our pipeline looking for uh, university groups, young biotechs who have uh, early projects. And quite often we are faced with projects which are very interesting, very novel, and, and a lot of energy, a lot of resources went into the project. But from our point of view, they are nearly there, but not on target. And this is uh, really uh, disappointing in, in that sense that a lot of resources, a lot of effort went into this one. And we thought it would be good if we would be involved early on, can give some advice in, into certain things. So from a company perspective, what is important for us? So what's important from a market point of view, from a medical point of view, from a development point of view? And uh, in that regard, we uh, thought we offered to interested parties our incubator, which means we would have a regular contact with those parties it gives them advice from our in-house expert, which really goes from, from early research, preclinical, CMC, which is quite some time an, an, an issue, so and, and make uh, proper decisions for, for chemistry or biologicals, you name it, what, what you have to, to have it uh, correctly. Also some, some regulatory things, we have some funding expertise. So everything which, which might be useful for the companies or the research groups, which helps their project to be, be shaped and, and focused. And so, so this is what we, we offer from the internal point of view. And ideally, you have a win-win situation. 
uh, incubator residents gets gets input gets uh, knowledge um, and and we also get to know that that project it's it's really mainly about knowledge and advice exchange what it is it's not so much on the money level right because it, it's sometimes they are funded we might give advice on how to get extra funding and whatnot and ideally so what we dream of is that we bring that project to a stage where we can talk about in licensing amr or antibacterial projects are also part of it so i mentioned icurus is antivirals antibacterials so it, it's sort of a an, an even split so we are running it now for the third uh, time have have quite some some uh, experience with it and the idea is that we have plus minus 10 companies, research groups currently in our IQ beta, which normally runs for a three-year uh, period. Uh, we have um, good success uh, so far with, with a project that we could help certain companies to get extra funding. We have uh, extended some collaborations with, with some have uh, side projects started. So, so it, it's really, as we wanted, uh, quite a win-win uh, situation for all parties. And that brings us to our weekly contribution from JLL and Travis McCready. Hey, Travis. Hey, Jim. The past week, it would seem that the word for the week is layoffs. The most high profile, obviously, have been announcements from big tech. While no two companies cite precisely the same reason, given the looming R word on the horizon, these layoffs from global commercial juggernauts are sadly, in the short term, somewhat predictable. The life sciences as a sector has not been immune. Unlike with big tech, the rolling tally to date does not include household names like Amazon or staggering numbers in the thousands. However, the net cumulative effect is no less jarring. In fact, for biopharma, layoffs have been persistent throughout most of 2022. Whether it's a once darling biotech like Rubius Therapeutics, 82% of its workforce, a promising upstart like Adaptimmune, 30% of its workforce, or mainstays like Illumina, the diabolical mixture of unmet clinical expectations, underperforming preclinical assets, unfavorable data, tighter public markets, and venture capital constriction have required companies to conserve capital and deject or cease work on certain clinical programs. The product of these decisions has been to trim workforce, and in the case of real estate, live within one's means. Not a day goes by that my colleagues and I are not asked what this all means for the life sciences as a sector long term. Will it continue to grow? What does demand look like? Has science stopped? There are lots of ways to answer these questions, and this week we received yet another perspective out of the mouths of babes, rather perhaps one babe in particular. Demographers at the United States have modeled that somewhere in the world this week was born Earth's 8 billionth inhabitant. In part, what makes this milestone so profound is that it comes just 12 years since we passed 7 billion, and less than a century after there were only 2 billion inhabitants on the planet. The causes and implications of Earth now supporting 8 billion people are staggering. But one thing is for certain, much of the rapid growth has been driven by advances in public health, the life sciences, and medicine, which have not only allowed more children to survive to adulthood, but have also dramatically extended average human life expectancy. The day of 8 billion, as the UN calls it, was made possible by rapid technological advances like computing in the 20th century, widely regarded as the age of physics, and our current century, regarded by many as the age of biology. In that time, there has been a steadily increasing rate of introduction of novel drugs approved by the FDA based on discoveries in cell and gene therapy, DNA and RNA therapeutics, conjugated antibodies, and other approaches. A recent study analyzing trends in FDA drug approvals observed that our greatest strides have been with anti-cancer drugs, biologics, virology, and previously undruggable rare diseases. However, relatively slow progress has been made in drugs for neurological disorders and metabolic and lifestyle diseases like obesity and diabetes. Unfortunately, when comparing leading causes of death in the 1900s to today, some of the same neurological disorders and metabolic lifestyle diseases remain on the list. Cancer remains on the list. 
At the other end of the spectrum, notwithstanding the extraordinary progress we have made treating rare diseases, still only 5% of known rare diseases have one or more approved treatments. While scientific advances have enabled us to make average progress in many categories, in too many cases that progress is demographically inequitable, largely to the detriment of women and people of color. And lastly, despite our progress increasing average human longevity, the specter of senescence and age-related diseases looms ever-present, forcing us to confront a very different reality between living longer and living a longer quality life. In other words, whether that means another billion inhabitants on Earth or not, as an industry, there is quite a ways to go before we have reached peak life sciences. The astrophysicist Neil deGrasse Tyson once quipped that as our area of knowledge grows, so does the circumference of our ignorance. We certainly are in the midst of an industry slowdown by many measures, but there is much yet that we do not know. Diseases on which we have not have yet to make progress and, regrettably, health threats that remain on the horizon. Indeed, there is business yet to do and growth yet to come. Moreover, investing in this industry requires patience and the steadfast commitment that our progress will allow for the 8 billionth inhabitant born this week to live a longer, more quality life than those who have come before. Thanks, Jim. Good to be with you, and I'll see you next time. Thanks as always, Travis. And of course, I'm not expecting to have any news next week because it will be Thanksgiving. So hopefully we'll catch up again in two weeks' time when it will already be December. Travis McReady is the leader of JLL's Life Science Markets Advisory Practice in the Americas, working closely with the global and scaling life sciences companies, developers and investors to achieve breakthroughs. He has more than 25 years of experience spearheading successful ventures related to technology and innovation, including as president and CEO of a $1.6 billion life sciences funding agency. And that's it for another week. I'm about to head online to buy some new equipment as I've been having computer connection and headset issues. So I hope you enjoyed this week's themed podcast and that wherever in the world you may be, you have a great week ahead and you'll join us next time for another Beyond Biotech. <laughs>